somehow, some way, your body is able to produce one of the most dangerous acids known to mankind. That is hydrochloric acid. Hey everybody, Organized Biology here where we make difficult biology concepts simple. So today we're talking about how certain stomach cells are actually going to produce this acid and dump it into the stomach. So hydrochloric acid will be confined to the stomach inside lining. So in order to understand how it produces it, we have to zoom into the stomach lining itself where we will see these cells called parietal cells. We'll also see the lumen or the inside lining of the stomach. And we're also going to see the bloodstream butted up against these parietal cells. These cells will be stimulated by three different stimuli. Number one being a hormone, gastrin, which literally translates to the stomach hormone. So this will be chilling out in the bloodstream and it will communicate to these parietal cells that, hey, there's food coming in. We need to start producing hydrochloric acid. The second thing that will stimulate it is histamine. Now, histamine is a classification of molecule that usually stimulates inflammation and other sort of cellular responses, but in this case, it's going to be produced by certain cells around this region in response to gastrin. So histamine can also stimulate these parietal cells to start making hydrochloric acid. And then the last thing is going to be called acetylcholine. Now, acetylcholine is actually a neurotransmitter that is produced by the parasympathetic division of the nervous system. If you want to learn more about that, you can hop over to here. But parasympathetic, I always think of neurons that like to trigger the body to rest and digest. So if your body's getting signals that you're in a resting or digesting phase, this neurotransmitter will stimulate these parietal cells directly to start secreting acid. So all three of these things will start it. Now, what actually causes the acid to be produced? Let's check that out. Well, step one, we have to look inside of the bloodstream. At this point in the bloodstream, there is a decent amount of what's called carbon dioxide in the bloodstream. And this is produced in response to basically normal cell activity throughout the body. Now, compared to the parietal cells, the parietal cells will actually be relatively low in carbon dioxide for reasons I'll explain later. So this CO2 is actually going to diffuse across the membrane and fly into the parietal cell. This happens, simple diffusion, things moving from high concentration to low concentration. Once that occurs inside of the parietal cells, carbon dioxide will actually combine with a very common molecule of water. And this reaction will be catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Now this is just an enzyme that's going to basically staple these two molecules together to form a molecule called H2CO3, otherwise known as carbonic acid. To learn more about this process, go ahead and watch this video quick before hopping back here. But this is carbonic acid, and we know that acids like to add a common ion called hydrogen ions into the solution. So what's going to happen here is carbonic acid is going to form that hydrogen ion and also form a conjugate base called bicarbonate. Now notice right now, what are we trying to produce? Hydrochloric acid, HCl, right? Now, H is the first part of that, right? So we need to get this H where? Well, we need to get it into the stomach lumen, this opening, right? So somehow, some way, we need to get that out there. So let's follow that track first. There will be a very large enzymatic protein in this membrane. And this is called a proton pump or a proton ATPase pump. Okay, so there's a lot of words here. Well, proton, a proton, interestingly enough, by itself is just a hydrogen ion. If you know about chemistry, hydrogen just has one proton, and when it's ionized or charged, that's all it has is just one proton. So it's a pump that's quite literally going to pump this proton right here. Now, it's an ATPase pump, and that's just a fancy way to say that we need ATP energy to fuel the pump. To learn more about pumps and other proteins, you can check this out. But we're going to stick here, and we're going to show that ATP which is produced by these cells in general cell respiration, is going to be utilized, and it's going to actually pump these hydrogen ions across the membrane into the lumen. But in doing so, we actually pump back in a potassium ion, which I'm going to draw in blue. So there we have it. The proton pump used ATP, pumped hydrogen out, brought potassium in. Now, in order to keep this thing happening, to keep pumping hydrogen ions out, we actually need to allow potassium to leave so that then it can be pulled back in. So potassium may actually leave pretty frequently through what's called a potassium leak channel. And it will allow that potassium, being pretty high inside the cell, to slowly leak out to then be utilized again in the proton pump whenever it needs it. So it's a beautiful little cycle to keep that hydrogen going out. Wonderful. So we got the hydrogen out now. That's great. But we also need one other component. And you probably guessed it already. Chlorine. So where does the chlorine come from? We've got the hydrogen. Where's the chlorine? Well, we've got to look back into the bloodstream here. The bloodstream has a relatively good amount of what's called chlorine ions. And as you've seen with all of these ions here, we need some sort of transport protein to get it into and out of the cell, right? So we're going to have a little protein here 
Now this protein is actually pretty interesting. In order to get that chlorine in, we actually have to fire it by bringing bicarbonate out. Now bicarbonate, remember, was right here. So bicarbonate, since it's being produced inside these parietal cells, will actually travel through what's called this bicarbonate chlorine antiport, which basically means opposite directions, and it will pull bicarbonate into the bloodstream while subsequently bringing chlorine from the blood into the cell. So at this point, I've mentioned multiple proteins here. I definitely recommend you hop over to my membrane proteins video after this to understand the complexities of these proteins in a very simple way. Now, once chlorine is inside, have we finished the job? I don't think we have because we need chlorine to go into the lumen, right? To join our hydrogen ion, right? So chlorine is going to begin getting in relatively high concentrations inside this cell. So all we need is a type of uniport protein, which will allow chlorine to basically find its way from high inside the cell to low outside in the lumen and then be trapped in that other direction because uni means one direction. It's like a one-way door, it follows through there and once it gets past, the door shuts, it can't get back in. So that is how we produce hydrogen and chlorine. So now that we have hydrogen ions and chlorine ions into the lumen, that's hydrochloric acid. It's inside the stomach. A quick clinical connection before you go. Have you ever heard of what's called PPIs? PPI stands for proton pump inhibitor. Now y'all are smart, where is that proton pump? Well, it's this guy right over here. So if we inhibit this proton pump from acting, that's going to prevent hydrogen ions from getting into the stomach. That actually will decrease your stomach's acidity. This is a great treatment for what's called GERD or gastroesophageal reflux disease. Because whenever you have reflux, you have acid getting into your esophagus, burning that lining, and it hurts. It's called heartburn, right? So if we lower the stomach's acidity, it won't burn as badly. Now, you don't want to be on these all the time, because why do we make hydrochloric acid in the first place? Well, the reason you make acid in your stomach is because you eat foods that have a lot of protein in them. And proteins are these really big molecules that in your digestive system you have to break apart, right? And hydrochloric acid will help to unfold those proteins so that you can break them down easier otherwise known as protein digestion. So you don't want to take these PPIs for too long because it could inhibit your protein digestion capabilities. Now to learn more about the digestive system, I recommend you hop over to this video here.